welcome again to the NPTEL course on storage systems. In the previous class, we were starting to look at a device driver and the, what is the functionality of the device driver was to count the number of interrupts. So, we took a look at some aspects of that particular program and uh, for example, we went through the write case, right. In the right case, what are we doing? We are essentially uh, determining the size of the buffer that has to be allocated in the kernel, right? We also did some, just did some sanity checking out here. Mm -hmm. Then we allocated it here, right? Then we set the recording on, okay? And then what would happen is that now that the recording is on, Every time there is an interrupt, we will enter, we will like on the entry of the interrupt, we will do this, at the exit, we do this, right? Because our, we have defined p enter irq to be this, p enter p leave irq to be this, and this is the an external, it is a, it is an external um, function pointer, that means it is actually linked with this other outside uh, code, okay, where that is getting called, okay, on interrupt, right, on interrupts, okay, these two things. So, I think uh, we looked at uh, some part of it last time. So, we look at this enter IRQ one more time, okay. We are assuming that uh, wherever it is being called, this p enter irq, it comes with the request routine and the CPU, okay, and that is basically what is out here. And first what we do is we spin lock irq scale. Now the thing is, why do we do a spin lock? Because normally these things are very fast operations. If you try to put somebody to sleep, it is too costly, basically because you have to do context switch, okay? it is too costly. So, for example, it might take a context switch about possibly a good for good part of a millisecond, whereas a spin lock is just sitting and executing instructions. An instruction can be about few nanoseconds, okay, Ten, okay, tens of nanoseconds, okay. So, if you are able to get your job done quickly within tens of nanoseconds, trying to sleep is going to be about almost four or five orders of magnitude more costly. So, I do not want to do sleep if it is possible, okay. So, uh, so that is one thing and in addition on, it, on the interrupt handlers you are not supposed to sleep, so there is another reason, we will come to that, okay. Mm -hmm. So, what is this guy doing? It is basically trying to ensure that you save the state of the interrupts because there could be multiple interrupts, some interrupts may be on, some interrupts may be off, you want to save the state and that is being done through flags. The flags is the thing that is going to keep track of the saved state, okay. And uh, the lock that you are taking is this one, you are spinning on this lock. This lock was initialized somewhere here. You remember that when I loaded the module, it was initialized out here, okay. So, now I think we need to study a bit about uh, the kind of mechanisms that are available for mutual exclusion slash synchronization in the kernel. So, we will take a look at that one, okay. I think some of it already we have done, but let us take a look, okay. So, basically what is the issue? It turns out that there is often shared data between different parts of code and kernel. Some are accessed in the user process context and some interrupt context. Now, I think you should be clear about what the user process context means. It does not mean executing in user space. It means that you could start in user space, once you come into a system call, you still enter into the supervisor mode, but you still have the same context because you got called through a user process, 
okay that means that you still have essentially the same thread is running starting from your user code what you written and then you walk into the kernel you are still having the same context in some sense. In some sense if inside the kernel I say something about that my current process is this it is still valid I am talking about something which is out there which is corresponding to the code uh, the code which I am running inside the kernel also. Okay. There is a correspondence between what I am going to do inside the kernel and the outside world because the, the user process. Okay. So, whereas interrupt context is a different thing basically what is interrupt context mean it means that you are executing some piece of code which has no relation to what was just being executed and which got interrupted okay. because interrupts can come anytime I am doing something and some unrelated interrupt for example a disk interrupt or a anything can come okay, which is unrelated to my work or a tape interrupt let us say I am not dealing with any tapes at all. I can still get a tape interrupt. So, that has nothing to do with my current process. Whereas, when I am doing a user processing, what I mean is I have a system called I initiate a system called in user space. So, that means there is a connection between my user space program that context from which I came and also the system call that I am executing inside the kernel there is a connection. Okay. So, what happens is that sometimes there is some parts of code in the kernel that are shared even though one is in the user process context and interrupt context. Okay. A good example is suppose you have a disk driver and in the user process context you are doing something about allocating buffers or uh, using buffers whatever. Okay. So, you might be manipulating some queues, queues corresponding to buffers. Now, the interrupt context also can deal with the same thing. Why? Because suppose you initiated some activity of reading some block when it finishes the interrupt context will has to say that this particular block was read now I can insert it into the list of valid buffers. Okay. So, what will happen is that both the context that came through a system call inside the kernel and a, a completely autonomous interrupt context they can refer to the same queues they might actually manipulating the same queues because they can be manipulating the same queues they can be a problem if while the system call is doing something with respect to the queue links right the pointers okay the interrupt comes in and it might find it in an inconsistent state because the interrupt can come and at any instruction boundary okay because normally queues have a certain invariant for example let us say you have a doubly linked list so you might have an invariant about that forward if I go this direction that should be point in the reverse direction. Okay. So, I might have modified only one part the reverse might not be modified right. So, the invariant can be spoilt. So, you need to have some way of um, the mutual exclusion. Okay. So, in uniprocessor systems you can do it by setting and clearing interrupts and flags there is some way to do it. In SMP normally you have many there are many methods of doing it here we will just talk about spin locks. Okay. There are three types of spin locks you might have what is called the basic one read write spin locks and big reader ok. So, again lot of this keeps changing with Linux versions this is just a simplified version and this slightly the older version. For example, nowadays you have something called read copy update RCU ok which is extensively used. So, whatever I am saying is not really widely used currently, but uh, it is used here and there ok. So, everything I am saying you should uh, examine it carefully in the context of a current Linux kernels because things are changing all the time ok. But anyway read write logs basically when there are you have many readers and few writers it turns out that you might use read write spin logs. The vanilla one actually has no preference whether read or write ok. When you have read write spin logs basically if you have preponderance of readers you might want to give preference to readers than to writers ok. For example, you have a system with lots of file systems ok. So, the file systems are in a linked list and most often times you are walking it to get some information, but you are not modifying the file systems. The time when this information on the linked list changes is when you unmount and uh, mount file systems and that is usually a rare event. So, most of the time your linked list is 
not changing. That means that read operations can be many many more compared to write operations. Okay. So, these some of the spin locks can be optimized for reads compared to writes because those writes happen very very infrequently mounting time in the unmount and mount file system for example. Okay. So, there are also other things called big reader spin locks it is a type of read write spin locks it is even more optimized for uh, readers and there is a specific penalty for writes. Okay. So, there are also some things called semaphores we will not get into it right now. Okay. So, let us just look at an example of a, a spin lock and we will try to understand how it is used. Okay. So, so for example, let us say that I define a spin lock underscore uh, t that is my the name of the lock is my lock okay. and I initialize, initialize it to spin lock unlocked okay, it is unlocked. Now, I say my I O C T L. Now, what is uh, I O C T L? I O C T L is a I O control often provided by device drivers. Okay. What is I O control? It is some kind of a way of controlling the behavior of a device or some system. Okay. It has got essentially it has got all the uh, remaining functionality that has not been already handled by some other means typically. Okay. Let us say there is some specific functionality read write etcetera those things are handled through specific interfaces. There could be some other residual functionality which has not been completely characterized or proper it is varying across uh, this lot of variations. Okay. So, you do not want to <coughs> tie down to saying that all these variations should be there in my in my list of function, functionalities. I will just put it into, into I O C T L. Basically, I O C T L is a, a way in which I provide some control operations on this I O or I O devices, I O whatever. Mm -hmm. okay. So, normally what happens is that I call I O C T L sitting from user space. Okay. So, there is a similar thing for files, it is called F N C T L. Okay. You might have seen it if you have, you might have seen it uh, in POSIX, there is something called FNCTL. Okay. That is also something which does gives you an ability to control information regarding a particular file. For example, you might specif specify that uh, FNCTL through FNCTL that it has got what is called the uh, there are some file systems which allow you to specify what is called an extent that is a how contiguous allocations you are requiring anytime you allocate anything to the file. Instead of standard 4 kilobytes, let us say I have multimedia file, 4 kilobyte is too small for multimedia files, you prefer in, in 1 megabyte chunks. Okay. Then you can use an FNCTL, you make a call using FNCTL and say for this particular file in media multimedia file, please ensure that you allocate only in terms of 1 megabyte chunks. Okay. Similarly, in IOCTL also, for example, once upon a time, you had floppies which had 1.44 megabytes or 2.88 megabytes, single, double, all those things, right? Right. So the thing is that you might have, uh, you may want to set I O C T L saying that now I want you to write it assuming it's double density or single density, whatever it is. Okay. So I can make a call. Okay. Since I'm calling from a user space, when I and it turns out to be the I O C T L will be. Uh, Essentially, it will come here through a system call. There is a I O C T L call, system call, and once it comes, it comes with appropriate driver routine. Okay. Now, essentially, from user space, it came through system call, and now I am in my driver part, my I O C T L. Okay. So that's why I am definite in the process context because I came through a system call. I still have connection with the party who initiated it. Okay, and now, uh, since I am coming from process context, it is known that interrupts are enabled because since I am coming from process context, it means it is not absolutely critical because it user, user stuff can be always be interrupted. Okay. Therefore, he is going to say IRQ to tell it please disable interrupts. Okay. Basically, I am saying spin lock IRQ. There are other varieties like spin lock if I know that interrupts already disabled or no race with interrupt context. That means that I am doing something okay, and whatever I am doing none of interrupt handlers ever touch. Suppose I am able to figure it out. 
okay then that guy can use spin this the more simpler circular spin rock okay so now that uh, you know interrupts enabled i have to say spin lock irq and then i do whatever i have to do okay so and then i pin unlock irq so basically this has interrupts get disabled for me here at this point so i am in a safe situation there is no question of these conditions okay convert whereas suppose i i have a my irq handler this is an interrupt handler okay that is there is a disk block which got completed and there is a callback after the disk block has been read okay. now the handler is basically this something similar to this and this came in once sometime in the past somebody did something and now that context is different from the context that is the interrupt handler because this interrupt handler is happening only because an interrupt okay this one has no connection with what's currently executing okay so it's in the interrupt context and because in interrupt context it's not uh it is known that interrupts are disabled okay so for that reason you may can take spin lock without having to do this part okay sometimes it turns out that you are coming from multiple levels of uh, uh calls to multiple subsystems and you may not know exactly whether interrupts are disabled or enabled okay if you are in that uh, unknowing state okay not knowing what is going on okay you can just say irq say okay it will uh, figure out it will actually make this, make it so that you don't have to worry about the state will be saved everything will be fine okay and then you do the reverse part of it when you exit okay so what is the basic premise of a spin lock <coughs> there are some interesting things that you have to worry about in spin locks okay as i mentioned already you are you are spinning to get access to a resource if somebody has locked it you expect the other party will unlock it since you are keeping on checking whether the lock is available or not when that party unlocks it you will get access to it of course there will be a contention multiple parties can try to get this at the same time somebody wins or something okay but you will notice that uh, there are some additional things that you have to be careful about while programming these things in the kernel okay one thread okay basically busy waits on a resource on one processor while another is on another this is true for multi processor but notice that your code even though we write it for multi processor it should run even on a single processor where n equal to 1 okay if you are if you are saying that this particular thing only runs for n equal to 2 it never will touch uh, it can it's not something acceptable as per most uh, specifications okay whatever code you run if it can run on a multi processor it should also run on a single processor okay now suppose if code has to work for okay, okay. for example if all threads are one processor let us say that i allocate all the threads are one processor okay and then if a thread tries to spin lock that's already held by another thread because it's a single processor if i am spinning let me other guys are not on the cpu okay if i'm spinning the other guys are uh, the other guy cannot can never get access to the cpu because i'm spinning continuously okay therefore the other guy who has a lock can never be woken up and he cannot give access to the lock which this guy is spinning on therefore there will be dead lock okay so one important thing is that you should never give up cpu when holding a spin lock because the absolute acid rule that means that whenever you have a spin lock in your hands never give up your cpu okay if you do that your system can dead lock okay so these are some of the interesting things that you have to know when you are programming in the kernel okay now similar to that let's also talk a bit about top and bottom halves so some of you might have heard about already this what is the top half executed in process context the same thing for example this is an example of a top half okay you are coming from the process context you are in the kernel okay that's the top half okay and because you are connected with the system call you are whatever you are executing something in the kernel you are still connected with the thing you can access the address space or in older unix is called u area of the calling process that means you still have access to the context of the process that made the system call okay you can still refer to it okay for example you can 
look at how long it has been executing all those kind of you can do it there are some there is some information about the time taken etc or the resources you have to work and all those things you can normally there's a resource structure it tells you how much you can use okay how many files can be open and all those kind of things now inside this top of routine you can actually look into all those things they, they make sense because you are executing on behalf of a process which has called a system call and you are connected with it okay and you can also put the process to sleep okay basically because essentially you are putting that particular process which walked into the system call to sleep is perfectly fine there's nothing uh, uh, upsetting about it whereas it is the bottom of routines these are asynchronous these are called because of things like device completions some read etc devices get completed they called asynchronously the executed system context and there's no relation to the current process because the, so there was a current process and because of that interrupt that interrupt handle started running and then it called the bottom of routine okay and the thing is this bottom of routine has nothing to do with the process that was executed that was being that was interrupted okay therefore you cannot access the address space or rear of the current process whatever is called the current process is not possible okay it may not sleep also because either you can get in deadlock or you are creating delays okay you are creating latency if there is multiple stack of interrupts if you sleep then other guys they can get all stuck till the topmost level interrupt can fire okay that also is possible okay so the thing is if top of routine is running has to block interrupts to prevent bottom routines seeing inconsistent data structures i already discussed this basically if top of routine is running right basically that guy could be manipulating some data structures it might have just done some part of the thing and it is still the data structure inconsistent and this interrupt comes in and the bottom of now runs and that will see the inconsistent part okay you have to block it okay now this is the way it, most uh, unixers used to be in the early 80s you will see that linux has a slightly different model it slightly adds to certain additional things okay inside we will skip this part okay let's look at the kernel part of it now the kernel threads are those which do not have user context these are things that run independent of the user for example you have something called housekeeping activities there is some stuff which is a uh, kernel memory which is uh, is cached okay which is caching some stuff on the disk and you kept it cached and it is not yet returned to disk okay now you can have what is called a, a thread a kernel a kernel daemon which will once in a while wake up and uh, ensure that part of it is flushed to disk because if you don't flush it regular times if power fails or whatever happens you might lose whatever that was there in the kernel okay that dirty buffers that were there you may not be able to flush it to disk because of power fails and you might have the the disk might not have the current copy of what was supposed to be there okay for example you do some banking transaction okay and you updated a thing suppose it's sitting in memory and it power fails okay essentially it's equivalent to your bank transaction not going through okay so there is a demon which keeps firing in and this independent of any user process context because it's doing for everybody in some sense you can call it house maintenance operations okay housekeeping operations okay and they are done for every process so it's nothing not, not bound to any particular process that's why you do not have user context there are also what are called deferrable and interruptible kernel functions okay and uh, bottom of what i talked about previously is one type of it this is how linux also started with but then they added these things okay now what is the bottom half in the linux version how we started out you can have uh, basically multiple bottom halves cannot be run concurrently on several cpus there has to be only one thing at a time okay that was all big problem another thing was that the bottom half was a particular subsystem for example a disk will have one particular bottom half networking subsystem will have one particular bottom half things like that okay tty will have one etc okay okay so this is all fixed also that is we had fixed number of bottom halves okay so because basically depending on the type of devices that were there okay that's how it started out that's why there's no dynamic allocation okay and you cannot run uh, you can only run one thing at a time okay it's extremely restrictive okay then you came with something called tasklets okay multiple tasklets the same type cannot run concurrently on several cpus for example i cannot have the same disk uh, tasklet running on same things i can have a disk running on one cpu and a tape running on something else on a 
I can have some other uh, let us say a network exploring some other thing because they usually are three different subsystems they usually do not interact usually. So, that by definition they do not have any things to uh, they do not clobber each other's stuff ok so they can be wrong ok. And uh, it turns out that uh, you can have uh, dynamic allocated mm, and uh, they can be this slightly more flexible kind of model and uh, again I am not going to too much detail about this one ok. The soft IRQs are the most uh, general ones ok. You can have the same type running on different CPUs. For example, I can have I have let us say 700 disks on my system ok. I can have I want to run all of those things they are they are doing all these operations at the same time right. All these disks are running at the same time. So, a few number of them can be finished some operation at this around the same time ok. I want to do the interrupt processing about the fact that they finished reading something or writing something ok. It will be very restrictive for me given that I have 700 disks right to say that you have to do it in sequence one after another even though I have so many CPUs right. So, these things are basically re-entrained that means that they ensure that the way the code is written itself they ensure that they take all the locks to ensure that even if the same type same code is running ok on so many CPUs because the way they take the locks they are able to keep the data structures completely let us say consistent okay, across each of these parties who are running at the same time ok. So, because it is a uh, most general part it turns out that they cannot be dynamically located ok ok. Again we have to go into greater depth to understand why that is the case I think we can I am not going to go into details here ok. So, this is the current model in Linux ok. <coughs> okay. So, I hope I have given you some feel for this part of it spin lock IRQ save etc. And so, what is happening on entering? I I am checking if it is recording ok. If it is recording then I will do it other I am not going to do it ok. And I am also checking next event is uh, not equal to last event. Basically, what is what is happening? I have a set of buffers, right? I I did the first one, second one. I came to the last one. I'm trying to see if my pointer is at the last one. Okay? If I already come to the last one, then means I don't have any more to write. That's fine. Okay? That's not the case. Then I'm saying read timestamp call. Okay? And then I'm writing it into this particular variable. I think I discussed it last time. This is the read. Uh, this is the assembly language code that does it. Okay. And then I'm creating an event. This is a simple, straightforward uh, uh, thing. It is basically it's creating some kind of data structures. Nothing more than that. Hmm? And then I'm saying I'm ready for the next event. I set the pointer to the next uh, place in the buffer. I have to be there. Okay. This is basically incrementing it to the next uh, location of the buffer. Okay. And then once I'm done with this, I'm going to do this. Again, I'm using you can say IR to say because I don't know uh, what state I could be in, so I'm just making sure that I save the state. Okay. The reason could be that uh, there are so many interrupts possible because I can have stacking of interrupts. Okay. And I'm not very clear about exactly what state I'm in currently at any point in time. Therefore, I'm doing this. Okay. Again, leaving also is um, something similar. I basically get a lock and then I basically record that event ok. I am also going to say that this is going to be the living event ok. Here I said that this is the entering event this is going to be a living event and then I increment to the next uh, um, buffer location ok. I am also recording for example which CPU did it ok. Fairly straightforward ok. And then once I am done with it I exit ok. So, so, what have we done right now? You first in this code in the right code basically you allocated buffers you started recording on and then this interrupt started happening and then this read timestamp call this assembly language code started recording which interrupt which CPU what time all those things right. It keeps doing it till the whole buffer is full I give it a certain buffer size right this much and then it completely has filled it up. Once it comes to the end of the buffer then it stops ok. 
So that is what is going to happen. So, once uh, it is completed it stops and uh, uh, essentially what is happening is that uh, even if the interrupts happen okay, you are still getting into this code, but you are not doing anything. Okay. It is a slightly uh, one, one can imagine writing better piece of code as soon as you uh, let us say come to end right. You may want to not you may want to um, not do all this uh, IRQ save all the kind of stuff right. You may want to do it make it a null function like it is possible right. That is something you may want to think about okay. So, but it is just uh, doing nothing here okay. It is just getting this thing and coming out that is it okay. It is sitting there out, out there okay. So, now the trace of all the interrupts have now been captured sitting in kernel memory okay. It is actually virtual the pageable kernel memory okay. that is where it is sitting there okay tell you somebody tries to read it okay. What is the read? Read is out here. How is the read being done? Read is being done through the user code okay. So, what is happening out here? You have this is the main of the user code okay. This is a regular user space code okay. So, I am going to say read FD etc. So, FD is 0 that means that you are doing some redirections. Okay. Basically, what you are doing is you are going to say that this particular program is going to have this less than followed by slash temp int s. That means that it is slash temp int s will have f d of 0. Okay. That is why when you say read f d etcetera, it is going to the read of this device which I created. That means that it is going to call this. You will see that there is a you can see that the number of parameters are different. Here is a regular read call as you are used to. You have got three parameters f d, it has got the size and it has got the address right. So, you are supposed to fill in that stuff here right. You are supposed to read something and put it here right. Now, whereas here you can see it has got how many parameters? One parameter, two parameters, three parameters, and four parameters. Okay. That means that there is something in between this system call and where the driver gets it. So, like Z or some other intermediate thing will be sitting there and doing it. Okay. Why, why, why should that be the case? Because you can notice that there is an offset also. You remember that in the case of read, the offset is implicit where I am reading it because I am keeping on adding to I am keeping on incrementing the implicit uh, offset every time I do a read right okay that is going on okay. So, I do not mention that pointer it is implicit in the it is kept in the file descriptor somewhere okay that information is kept okay and some piece of code is coming in between that call and here which is actually putting that stuff this offset here okay. So, that is one part of it and also it you can see it started with file descriptor there it has been converted into a struct file star okay. all this is happening okay. You do not have to worry about it there is already infrastructure in the system which can take care of all this okay. So, what is it doing now? <coughs> so, uh, now reading stuff okay. So, what is it saying? It is saying read from slash temp int s okay and read about what is size of e, what is e is, a, e is an event. So, I want you to read as many bytes as the size of the event. I think if you note if you notice what is the what are we writing when we what is the information we are collecting for an event that I think we have seen already where is that event ok this is a, this is information ok or the if you look at the event uh, uh, structure it will have all that, that piece of information okay. So, that is what it is supposed to read again it is doing some sanity checking out here if not event buffer it should not happen, but by the sheer bad luck for some reason who knows there could be a bit flip as I told you you can your memory can lie your disk can lie okay all kinds of bus can lie because what I mean by saying is that some errors can take place in the system okay. So, if you are a good OS kernel hacker you never trust whatever you see okay you check everything before you do it. Here what you are doing is you are checking if event buffer is null. 
somebody has to read some stuff you are worrying whether is there any buffer at all in the first place that is what you are worrying about. Okay. Most likely all these things usually they are it should be the case that there should be event buffer so you should never get into the situation but if it happens you report it okay. Again if you if recording okay so by uh, if some recording is still going on so I want to make sure that it cannot record it even this uh, uh, it could be that the write as soon as it uh, the interrupt routine right the minute it came to that end of it right it should probably set recording equal to 0 but it is not done it here okay one can add that code so that recording becomes 0 okay so it is being done here okay so again you are taking this uh, CLI STI as I mentioned these things are no longer available as far as I know in the current Linuxes you have to do something else here okay and what you are doing right now is you are going to you are now supposed to read from the event buffer and copy into user buffer okay the user buffer is given by here okay and e okay that event e okay this is the user space okay you give an address and you have to copy it from the kernel buffer right into this one okay as I mentioned to you you have to be careful about copying stuff from in and out of kernel that is why you are doing what is called copy to user okay and before that of course you have to do something about um, you are finding the minimum size okay and uh, you basically um, you are trying to read some number of bytes and it is trying to figure out what is actually available and that is what is the main part of it okay. And then it is going to copy from user to the event uh, from the event buffer to the user buffer and it is going through instead of doing a straight mem copy it is going to copy to user and the copy to user will carefully check everything whether the user buffer is actually a legitimate buffer is it uh, is not a booby trapped uh, buffer which when you touch it it explodes okay. Why is that the case because as you know uh, as, we, as we discussed last time also if there is anything that uh, a trap happens the kernel is there to pick it up right. If the kernel itself actually while it is touching something it itself gets a, a trap okay there is nobody to look after it okay because uh, in some sense you know you cannot keep on putting one more level okay kernel 0, kernel 1, kernel 2 see everybody watching for everybody else okay that does not work out okay. So, the thing is that is reason why you have to be careful that is why you use copy to user. It is ensuring that the, bu the buffer that user has given where the information has the event has to be copied into okay that is legitimate okay. And as I mentioned again there is an implicit pointer that has to be updated. And when you do a read and write once you read so many bytes or write so many bytes the implicit pointer changes and that is what it is. Okay. And you always when you do a read you always return whatever you read the size of it okay. because you remember the int there is usually the value that is returned after read is int okay. that is basically what it is. Okay. So, this is how the read happens. Okay. So, what we have done right now is I keep reading one event at a time exactly one event at a time. Once I read one event then I am going to uh, let us say populate my data structure e time and e cpu event dot time event dot cpu and then I am checking whether it is a entry into of the interrupt or the exit of the interrupt okay and the number also event number okay and I am also doing some sanity checks for example you should not do this because I have only in this particular example there are only two cpus it is checking whether only two cpus are there okay. This is some straightforward um, tracking of the time okay. In case I is just starting about when I am just starting about it tries to if it is 0 then I am starting okay and so it is taking care of that part. Once I have already looked at the first event then this is the code. If you look at this some there is some peculiar thing here I would like you to look at it closely. This 1263 is coming because if I remember right my student was looking at uh, 1.263 gigahertz uh, machine in those days okay. So, that 1263 is coming from the 1263 megahertz that is what it is coming from. Okay. Uh, basically these things are clock ticks okay. 
and if you really want time you have to look at the clock frequency and convert it into microseconds or milliseconds okay so that's what is going on okay again he is uh, checking the sanity of the whole thing he is basically uh, if it is enter he is uh, pushing it onto a stack and then it has should be a corresponding exit also okay and this should all match okay and uh, so that's what basically is doing okay if some of these things don't work then maybe something went wrong okay so is that is this stuff has already been captured is checking the sanity of or what has already been captured okay basically the interrupt should nest properly okay the nesting is what is doing okay? that's why i skipped some stacks he's got some two cpu stacks and this is uh, the stack nr is the number of interrupt levels okay so that's what he's doing out here okay so i think this more or less and, and then finally he's outputting it into some files okay okay basically he has got two files out.cpu1 these are all the interrupts all the trace of all the interrupts on cpu1 this is the trace of all the interrupts that were handled by cpu2 okay so he is basically writing to all those things okay depending on which cpu it is writing to fd1 or fd2 okay all right so this is roughly the the code corresponding to a device driver um that is counting interrupts the one thing which i have not covered is what happens when you want to unload this module okay this what will get executed again if it is still recording for whatever reasons you set recording equal to zero hmm? you free the event buffer because it is you have allocated kernel virtual memory and this kernel is running all the time any time you don't free then basically it's something like you lose that virtual address space okay so you have to free it this is what is called uh, some of you might have heard of what is called memory leaks okay if you don't do it then the kernel has memory leaks one day the kernel will choke up and die okay basically because the in, even though it has got gigabytes of virtual memory you are running so many of these things and a kernel is supposed to run for days and days together okay so every time you lose a few megabytes if you just uh, do it enough enough times okay then you finally will exhaust that space you are dead okay and you also don't want to call this again because remember this p enter irq if it is zero means you are not calling any of my driver if it is set to this values right enter irq or leave irq here right where is it um, where is it it oh it's here okay only because i said this is that i'm getting controlled into this two okay so i'm going to set it to zero saying that please don't call my driver at this point hmm? and then i'm also unregistering okay i'm saying that this device i know i want to release the major number so anybody can use it this seems to be a bug here this 233 and 66 i don't know what the story is okay so okay so this roughly the whole of this device driver okay so now this is an example of what is called typically called a character device driver okay this is not based on blocks okay it there's no boundaries uh, you can read here there is events are the some kind of boundaries you might call it but this is not something hard and fast it's up, it turns out to be the um let's say the data structure uh, that event has been uh, defined to be okay so the, there is some kind of a uh, structure to it but uh, these are not at the level of what we normally consider blocks okay okay and there's no caching going on typically in in block devices there is some kind of caching going on okay so here uh, this would be typically considered a character device driver of course this, this distinction between what is called a character device driver and a block device driver has been always been a fuzzy thing so we don't have to give it any name we can just skip it but uh, okay so we'll move on to the next uh, part which is i just briefly discuss uh, block devices um we will go into more detail later okay so what are block devices the good typical good examples are things like disk tape cd roms all those kind of things okay now you notice that in the previous case the character devices provided certain functionality we had things like what are the functionalities we had open close 
okay yeah read write open at least open in other unix it will be called close it is in linux it called release okay so you have read write open etc whereas here you will notice this is a kind of functionality open close possibly size strategy halt but usually don't have read write routines okay so this one major difference we we'll just go through it open what is it it basically can bring a device online or instance some data structures correspond to the device okay it may also set as like for exclusive use because it's a tape device only one user is using it because it's uh, you can have the rewind operations going on right so you want to ensure that only one party is if two or two parties come and say rewind that's going to be a big chaos okay so uh, you may want to set it for exclusive use also okay you might have a close that means you're done with the device you can size you may want to look at the device and say what is the size of the partition and those kind of information how many partitions are there etc okay. okay you can have what is called a strategy okay what is the strategy basically if you want to do any uh, reading and writing you go through strategy okay and basically this is a bottom up what it means is that this is not being initiated because of your system calls this being this being done as part of other activities basically what's happening is the device has a certain queue okay you queue the requests to them and then they are these requests are managed through strategy okay of course the word strategy is not used in linux but this is the old unix uh, name for it okay basically the reason why you have a strategy is because the minute you give a request it may not be right time to do the request immediately why is that because as i mentioned in block devices especially disks you want to do what is called clustering you want to get instead of doing the request immediately as soon as you somebody gives a request you want to wait for a few more requests and hopefully you have instead of just doing a 4 kilobyte or 1 kilobyte request you want to do some hundreds of kilobytes if possible okay you want to cluster them okay that's the reason why the guys make a request and they disappear okay the user process context walks into the kernel makes a request and runs away goes away and the strategy routine is the guy which wakes up and sees that it does all this clustering etc and tells itself okay now i have seen enough stuff okay now i can use my disk to some reasonable efficiency level now i will do it. so none of the users are doing it per se okay it is being done by the strategy routine that's why it's a bottom up routine okay it has no context it's no, it has got no user context and because it has got so many requests it can reorder requests because on a disk if you go all over the place randomly okay it's going to be costly okay if it is possible for it to go in a more disciplined fashion through the disk okay okay so that you go through in a certain order okay the requests that are that you have seen it might make sense of course the reordering requests can create problems for the application in case they have to be done in a particular order okay and in that case you have to do what is called you might want to insert what is called barriers so the barrier will essentially ensure that you force the system to completely finish certain operation for you take the next ones okay but in general the idea here is you are doing your requests most of the unix kind of programs are synchronously written programs okay what it means is that you are not really doing asynchronous i/o that means you write and then you wait that means there's nothing else is going on right typically it's single threaded programs single threaded okay only when you have multi threaded programs then you have a problem okay so you single threaded programs you make a request your process is stuck anyway and then there are other parties in the system they do not usually have anything to do with what i'm doing they also make requests so now the thing is i can easily take your requests and reorder them without any worry because they are all unrelated requests they coming from different people they are doing probably different things and so i can reorder them without too much trouble of course if i have a single program with multi threading like java for example or using postfix threads whatever then there might be some requirements for different threads might make requests and they might have to follow a certain order to get certain guarantees with respect to what really happens you want to do it consistently what gets updated to disk okay in that case you have to do something special okay so that you might say that uh, this particular design 
is for the old Unix, in the 1970s Unix where synchronous IO was more or less standard, no threading was there and multi, multi programming was going on, lot of people were sharing the same system. Okay. In that case ordering request is perfectly fine okay. mm -hmm. and this operates asynchronously. Okay. Synchronous means with respect to the process who initiated the request. This synchronous means there is no connection with that particular ordering. Okay. So, when somebody wants to start a new request, if the device is busy, you just queue it. Okay. Or it could also be the case that uh, there is a this is a slightly different situation. It may be that you need a free buffer, uh, we will come to that soon. Okay. There are some buffer caching routines that are there and you need to allocate a buffer for the one particular block okay. and if it is not freely available what you might want to do is you might want to flush a dirty block to make that buff one buffer available. Okay. So, in a sense what is happening is that you are doing a write not because user wanted it, okay. you are doing a write because somebody wanted just a free buffer, but you are doing a write unrelated write okay, which has nothing to do with my request, so that I give a free buffer. Okay. So, the strategy does all these kind of things that is why it is a bottom off, okay. it has nothing to do with any process context. Similarly, you have a halt and this is basically done not because of user, it is done usually because of some system uh, requirement. Okay. 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 So, usually these block devices they provide support to the buffer caching routines, so, the block devices typically have buffering going on. Okay. Typically, there is caching, extensive caching going on. Reason why, of course, is typically block devices have been slow, okay. tapes and disks, etc. Okay. Because they have been slow, caching has been a central part of the design since very beginning. Okay. That means that block devices, the device drivers have to uh, essentially provide support to buffer caching routines. That is something they have to do, that is a critical part of their. So, I will just mention some of these things quickly you can have things like buffer allocation algorithms, get block, you can have uh, buffer release, okay. you can have buffer read, buffer read asynchronous, buffer write etcetera. Okay. Basic idea is because the caching what is the thing that you want to guarantee is the following, if there is a block it has to be there exactly in one single buffer, it cannot be in two buffers, but in two buffers then inconsistency can rise. Okay, that's why there's a strict requirement. Okay, and then it can be in the free list or hash list. Okay, so now the interesting thing about uh, the system is that suppose I have a file which I'm reading. I got it into the cache. I didn't modify it. It is quite possible that somebody else, some other user, may also may also want the same file. Okay. So, even though I am done with my use, I can since it is cached I can make it available to the other second user much more rapidly, much more uh, less latency for that person. So, the thing is what happens is that I get some stuff, I am done with it, since I am done with it I can put it on a what is called a free list, but it is still valid content. Okay. If by sheer chance somebody else comes along and wants the same stuff. Okay. I look up the free list, if it is there I will give it to him directly because nothing has been modified. So, the system essentially what it is doing is that the first party takes the pain of getting it, the other parties can free ride on it. Okay. So, the idea basically is that you keep a free list and you manage the free list in such a way that you always pull out from the free list which either totally junk value, no content whatsoever or it has not been used for quite some time. So, what I will do is I have a free list and what I will do is if somebody got some file into the system, some block into the system and then I am done with my use, I will put it to the end of the list. Okay. And somebody wants a free block, sorry free buffer, I pull it from the front. Okay. That means that my effort at bringing it from a slow device into the kernel memory, since it is sitting at the end of the buffer list, right? till I am completely done with all these things, I do not have to be, it will not be touched. 
Okay, so there is chance that it can get reused. Okay, that's the plan. Okay, that's why it can be in free list or in hash list. Okay, hash list means I'm still using it in some sense. Free list means I used it and I'm done with it typically. Okay. Okay, so typically all this. Uh, uh, if you notice that this buffer allocation algorithms, they usually call this. Um, for example, B read, for example, will call a make a call to the, the read of the block device, okay, and write will also do a write on the block device, okay. So these caching routines depend upon this block call, okay. Now, in addition to all these things, it turns out most systems have what is called a block layer. So there is a device driver. There are lots of device drivers possible. Now you can have a device driver for a tape, you can have a device driver for disk etc. Or you can have it for CD-ROMs etc. Now it turns out that many of them might have some commonality. Okay. So because they are all talking in terms of reading in size some certain block sizes, they are talking about how to take care of interrupts okay, etc. Okay. There is some commonality of functions. Okay. So most operating systems typically provide a block layer also. Okay. So, the device drivers use the block layer infrastructure to get their job done. So, in a sense you can see a hierarchy developing, you have something like a file system on top typically, then you have a buffer cache layer next to it, then below it you might see a, a device block device driver and below it you might see a block layer. Okay, you will see, uh, so there is a lot of functionality that is spread across okay. and uh, basically this abstracts away the common functionality so that each block device driver does not have to reinvent the whole thing. Okay. But because it is doing it across so many different types of devices, getting it right is not easy. That is why we will see that Linux there has been a lot of changes in block layer design quite a bit. Okay. So, this has been changing quite a bit and uh, getting it right is non trivial. Okay. We will uh, at some point in the later we might actually take a look at this block layer design. The reason why I am saying it is because uh, one of our own students, Suparna in, in our department, she has designed the 2.5 Linux 2.6 uh, block layer design. She has done a good portion of it. We will talk about it later. Okay. So, um, Basically, if you think about this whole system, you will see there are a lot of interfaces, Type C, POS6, device driver interface, and you have to really be careful how to use the inf infrastructure. Okay, if you do it right, then it is easy. But there's a lot of functionality at different places. You have to know exactly what to use. I think we'll stop here for the time being, and then we'll continue for the next class.